influence from these great personalities who come before us. And so throughout the years, I've probably shared some examples about 10 mantras, counting them on the digits of your fingers, or recently, you know, a little example of a screw, how that relates to like, how to understand the value of life and relationship, maybe a little screw we find on the road. Anyways, many lessons that I share um, actually come from Vaishishi Prabhu, and most, more recently, he just came up with a beautiful book called The Four Questions. And in the Vedanta Sutras, in these aphorisms, there's one important phrase, one of the most important phrases in the Vedanta Sutras, it goes, Apato Brahma Jigyas. Now is the time to inquire. So this book of his kind of impacts this principle of the art and transcendental understanding of asking questions. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Vaisheshika Prabhu Haribo. I have to say one significant thing is you, you heard these drums, and Vaisheshapu is also an amazing Murdanga player. We have Anupam and many others. And you can hear the Murdanga from a few houses down. Sometimes a block away, if there's three or four of them going. It's a very powerful resonation. It really hits the heart, doesn't it? If you're outside and you start to hear the your time, you're like wanting to get in there. So along with playing Murdanga and engaging in powerful kirtan with the instruments and the chanting, Vaisheshapu has been very instrumental practically since he began in 1973 in serving what we call the Brihad Murdanga. It's the greater drum that Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada's Guru established. And this greater drum is in the form of the printing press. Because that drum can be heard far and wide beyond just a few blocks. So he's been a forefront leader in every area from publication to involving in the printing, editing, especially the, the mass distribution of Srimad Bhagavatam Bhagavad Gita. He's been one of our principal leaders uh, throughout the decades in showing a wonderful example in this uh, art of sharing this with others. In fact, yesterday we went door to door. He went into kind of a dingy, dark basement area. And I believe the lady opened the door and said, I was waiting for Krishna. Waiting for the Bhagavad Gita. Waiting for the Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> just, just random apartment places. And someone just opened the door saying, I was waiting for you. So this is the potency of this mood of uh, giving by Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you to Sri Krishna Prabhu and thank you everyone for being here today. And the Kishoris, Hare Krishna, welcome. Great to see you all. I'll start with a Mangala Charn. Mangala means auspicious and Mangala Charn means a way to start a talk in order to receive blessings. If you know it, you can please join with me. Om Jnana Timirandasya Jnananjana Shavakaya Chakshurun Miditam Nina Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha As Tushya Krishna Prabhu, our temple president, or co-temple president with Vrinda Sundari. They work together in harmony and have been a nucleus of this community for many, many years. Has just mentioned that I've finished a book which was meant to be a conversation starter. And uh, there are lots of conversations going on in the world. It's hard to restrain oneself from talking about what we've heard or seen here or there quite natural, even in the animal kingdom, as Prabhupada writes in one of his purports, that animals wake up in the morning, usually before us, if they're not nocturnal, and start talking about what kind of food they'd like to have for the day. And a book I've, books I've always known to be conversation starters. When you have a book, it's a calling card. You can enter into conversations that are already going on in various places. Somehow or other, humans love books. They have for centuries, for millennia. People have been writing things down since, we, since history can remember. When I researched my first book, which was called Our Family Business, which was a lot about publishing, I found that cultures since the time immemorial have been writing things down on whatever they could find to write on and whatever they could find to write with. There's a way 
humans, we know, are intelligent. They have ideas that they want to express them and give them to other people. My spiritual masters, Srila Prabhupada, and those who know his history know that he was very fond of books, especially because his guru was fond of books, and Prabhupada wrote 70 books plus in little more than a decade and also saw to the distribution of them in the millions before his departure. And he also encouraged his followers to write. He considered that it was a way of consolidating one's realizations, organizing. I find that to be true also. When I'm able to write down the things that I've heard or that I've thought of while practicing bhakti yoga, then it tends to solidify them. And also, a phrase I've coined for myself, which is that if you don't like what you're being subjected to, that is subjected to, then change the subject. There's a lots of ways in which we allow ourselves to hear things, see things, and so forth that are disturbing, yes? yes. I mean, sometimes they're put in front of our faces. I see on the airlines nowadays some wise person thought of putting a television behind, on the back of every seat. And now they're in grocery stores, and I even saw at the gas pump, they have a little television. So it keeps coming at you from every direction. There's lots of sound vibration and imagery in the world that comes to us and offers various subjects for consideration. As mentioned also in the Bhagavatam, that there are millions of subject matters to discuss. And if you don't like those subjects or what they're doing for you, as the Sri Upanishad in ancient literature, which gives commonsensical spiritual knowledge, says, the wise sages have said previously that one result is obtained by talking about the Supreme. And another result is obtained by discussing that which is not supreme. Does that surprise you? Does it sound like common sense to you? For instance, if I were to ask you if there was a difference just on a mundane level between scrolling on your phone. Has anybody ever done that? Do you know what I'm talking about? If you have, say yes. 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 It makes me feel better. <laughs> What's the difference between that and reading a book, for instance? Do you notice the difference? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> this is elevated to the next level when they, so the sages say, anyadevahur sambhavad, anyadahura sambhavad. Let's say the difference between reading the Bhagavad Gita, which is, I would say, euphemistically, a high-minded book. It is the most high-minded book because it comes from the intelligence of God. So what's the difference between that and randomly scrolling on your phone? Well, the sages say a lot. How much? A lot. Yeah, a lot. So there's a big difference. And <clears throat> bhakti yoga, or the process of Krishna consciousness, is very commonsensical. What we hear about comes the content in our minds and hearts. And if you look at the word carefully, Anybody here like words? One, two, three, four, <laughs> five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay. Content and content. It's the same word. And what we hear about, what we allow to come into our ears and through our eyes, and becomes our content. And that determines how content we are in life. If we're feeling discontent, we may look and see that actually it's because of the content that I have in my heart. When I was walking once in my neighborhood, I live in Burlingame, California, with my wife, Nirakula Devi Dasi, who is our videographer as we travel. And uh, I went for a walk, which I do frequently. I noticed that the storm drains in my neighborhood all have a placard made of iron and they're a little artistic and there's a a warning on them it says warning 
all that's dumped here drains to Bay. And what it means is, because we're close to the San Francisco Bay, anybody been to the Bay Area? Yeah. It's, our neighborhood's not that far away, so if you dump something in the gutter and it goes down the storm drain, it ends up in the San Francisco Bay. So I'd let you know if you visit again. <laughs> so it says, no dumping drains to Bay. That's the admonition. It has a picture of a fish. And as I was walking past, I was considering how our ears are like those storm drains. Whatever we allow to come in here ends up in the bay of our heart. And as is said poetically in one of the spiritual literatures that we read, the, the heart is like the driver, the body's the chariot. It's our emotions that push us, not just in this life, but also, as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, so straightforwardly that whatever we have our minds and hearts especially fixed on when we leave this present body that we're in now. Didn't want to spoil anybody's day, and I know it's a family show, but that does, does happen. Uh, that determines where we go. We're determining our own future by how we've developed not just our mind, but our heart. What are we attracted to? What are we absorbed in? What do we like more than anything else? So, how to change the subject? Well, one way for me is to write a book. And in the book, as Tushta mentioned, I call upon the most simple process for self-realization, and that's asking the question. Occam's Razor says that the simplest answer is usually the best. And spiritual life is simple because it's intuitive also. In fact, if a system of philosophy is too high-minded to allow access to everybody, then philosophers reject it ultimately. Wise people reject it. This Radhika Raman, the great pundit and child prodigy, once mentioned to me while we were having a discussion and going for a hike, and he said, a philosophy that doesn't have access is useless. If you talk high-mindedly, but then someone says, how do I enter into the process? How can I experience it from my home? I live in an apartment with a parakeet, and I have to go to school every morning, and I don't like most of my teachers, and my foot hurts, and I don't like going home to see my parents because they always bug me. How could I, in that situation, have access to this experience you're talking about, this connection with God. And the simple answer comes at the very beginning of arguably the most important of all spiritual books because it's a summary of all the most important principles in the Vedas. The Vedas are a huge body of literature, but they get condensed into what are called Upanishads, and the Upanishads get summarized into a book called the Vedanta Sutra. And sutras are little codes, like computer codes, and from them expand unlimited amounts of information. So the first one is Atato Brahma Jignasa, and it says, now's the time to inquire. So that's simple, right? Say yes. yes. Yeah, ask a question. So, in my thought process, in writing the book, I considered that this Atato Brahma Jignasa, Brahma means God, Supreme, what's the highest thing you can think of? Ask about that. It's inviting us and saying, your question will be fruitful because the answer will be forthcoming if you ask. That's a enticing promise, isn't it? Say yes. yes. Yeah. And the first question in the book that I pose as a point of departure is, what is my purpose? Oftentimes, we find ourselves engaged in activities, perhaps we may even call rituals, that we do by cultural momentum. Does that sound familiar? Maybe inherited a ritual from your family 
and they just say, do it, don't ask any questions. But it's most helpful, say the sages, to know why you're doing things and to be very purposeful in your life, what to speak of in your spiritual practice, what to speak of existentially, understanding why you exist and what the purpose of life is. So the first question is a why question. It's asking why I exist. And the question is, what's my purpose? And the next three questions, because there's four questions in the book as advertised on the cover. The next three help to empower one to fulfill the answer to the first question, which I'll go into in a minute. But they go as follows. The second one is, how may I be of service? What do you repeat? I'll start with the first one. What's my purpose? Because my, my claim is by asking these questions, you're going to benefit, so why not we say them together? The next is, how may I be of service? How may I be of service? The next, what's the lesson? What's the lesson? And the third is, where am I, where am I investing, investing my attention, my attention right, now? right now? Those are the four questions. And what I'm saying right now is that when, if you ask the first question, and you can ascertain by divine revelation, which I will explain as a result of asking that question, then the, the next three help us to enact our purpose in life. Fair enough? Did you understand what I just said? Are you sure? Could you repeat it then? Who would like to say what I just said? Who's speaking? Some, okay, go ahead. Once we know our purpose, how do we enact it? Are you a writer? Yeah, you're, you're a writer and a thinker, and you're very articulate. Thank you for summarizing it. Did the Kishoris get it? Anybody representative? Who's the head Kishori? Oh, Jai Shivani. Jai Okay. One of the, here are three, keep it, I'm going to keep this very simple philosophically. Does that sound good? Yes. Yeah. So, here, I'm going to make three categorical statements about the philosophy behind what we're doing here. One is that God is intelligent. This is mentioned in the very first verse of the Srimad Bhagavatam, which, by the way, is a commentary on the Vedanta Sutra, the, what the book I said is the most important. So there's a commentary on it by the author of the Vedanta Sutra. He expanded upon all the sutras. And the first verse he writes in the Srimad Bhagavatam, who here has a Srimad Bhagavatam in their home? Okay, everybody else see me afterwards. <laughs> no, really, see me afterwards, I'll arrange one for you. And the first verse says that Krishna, and I'm going to use Krishna for, as the meaning of the supreme, the origin of everything, because that's, we need a little context, which comes as Janmagyasya Yataha. What is God? What is the supreme? The definition is that from whom everything else emanates. And there are many names of God. The name that's most popular for the Gaudiya Vaishnavas, that's the line we come in, is Krishna. Everyone say, it, please. Krishna. Krishna means all attractive. Much more to say about that, but we'll leave it at that for now. So when I say Krishna, I mean the source of everything, the original source, our original source. Okay? Look around you for a minute. Really, look around. Wherever you look, everything came from that original source. It's amazing, actually. So the first statement there is that God is intelligent. And Everything about him is intelligent. In fact, we can even observe our body and see that it works intelligently. You might notice that if it gets a little warm and you start to perspire, what is that, why does that happen? Where's Nitai? I need a doctor right now. <laughs> why does that happen, Nitai? Why do we perspire? So you can cool down. And 
That's an intelligent design. And if you go into any aspect of the universe, we find an organized system. This is not unique to the Srimad Bhagavatam. Anybody who's a thinking person who's looked at the universe and <clears throat> has noticed and remarked or written philosophers have mentioned the idea of logos, which means, which is actually the, the basis of any of the ologies in the world. Can anybody think of an ology? Kishoris, give me two ologies. But you got to do it quick before somebody else jumps in. Yes? Archaeology. Psychology. And psychology. There's two. So, ology comes from the word logos, which means that the universe is organized enough that we can do controlled experiments because it's not random and we can come up with consistent information, data and results. So that means the universe that we're in right now is intelligent. And as it, Krishna mentions in the Bhagavad Gita, Hamsarvasya Prabhupada, everything emanates from me and as more detail given in the Srimad Bhagavatam about how every aspect of the universe is intelligent. Even the limbs of our body, our hearts have neurons in them, which means we have brain cells in our heart. Did you know that? One person said yes, one person said no. It's, it's a modern research is showing, revealing more and more about the intelligence just of the human body. So, God's intelligent, his energies are intelligent, and the second principle is God is intelligible, which means he can be known. That's important, isn't it? Because if there is a way in which he was unknowable, we wouldn't have what is called a process of yoga. Yoga means to be able to come to know God and have a connection with God. So that's the second principle is you can come to know God. Well, how? Not necessarily by the modern scientific controlled experiment because by definition, God is beyond our control, right? Say yes on that one. There is a God and you're not him. Yes or no? Okay. You're going to get 1600 on your SAT. But he is intelligible and there is a system that you can come to know God. And that's why we have a practice. It's based on the fact that God wants us to know him. That's another aspect. That he wants to be known. Just think logically if you think of a mother and father who are raising a child. Who knows if the child actually recognizes the parents, viscerally of course, but what about when they actually come to know, oh you're my parents, you raised me, you're paying the bills, how about that? <laughs> when does that take place in child psychological development, at what age? Anybody know? 16? You know 16 year olds? Are th <laughs> Thanks mom and dad, I really have so much gratitude for you. <laughs> And maybe 32, 50, who knows. <laughs> but there is a way in which parents, even in the early development of a child, when a child looks and says, Mama, oh. <laughs> get a video, or dad, dad. And there's a sense, they, they want the child to interact with them. They want to have this relationship for the child to know who they are and how much they love the child. And this is the same with God. Conception of God as given in the Srimad Bhagavatam is he wants all of us to know him and to, to know how much he loves us and to reciprocate in that love. So that's the second. First one is God's intelligent. All his energies are intelligent. Second, he's intelligible. He's, he can be known. Why can he be known? Because he wants to be known. And since we're infant, we're minute and our power is not very great to know much of anything in this world. I'm 
reading a book right now called The Knowledge Illusion, written by a professor from Brown University. And I'm going to be meeting him on Wednesday morning because, as I said, books are a conversation starter. And we've been reaching out, our team has been reaching out to various thinkers who have written books. He wrote this bestseller called The Knowledge Illusion. And we're going to have a discussion about where any of the points of my book match his book and see where it takes us. And he points out in his book that we know very little about anything. He's a cognitive psychologist. And he just points out rather bluntly that we don't know much. We assume that we do. That's what the knowledge illusion is. I won't go into much more detail there. I'll move on with the basic simple point, And that is that although we don't know much and it's difficult for us to ascertain much in this world, because God wants us to know him, he can reveal himself to us. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, only about 10 people said yes. 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 I mean, you don't have to say yes, <laughs> unless I tell you to. Uh, and the, the third is a lyric, it's not even a lyric, it's a lyric, and it's also the name of a country song. Do you like country? Come on. <laughs> you know like country, huh? All right. Well, it's a country song and and the lyric is I thought you'd never ask. And I won't sing the song for you since you don't like country. I was gonna do it, but now I'm sorry. No, 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 it's too late. No. The scenario, however, if you read the lyrics, is that a man loves a woman, it's a very uncommon theme, and <laughs> wants the reciprocation, and when he finally asked her to marry him, she said, I thought you'd never ask. I thought you'd never ask. Does that sound familiar? Is that a familiar, Saren? You could turn it into a little story or a movie or something, sort of romantic thing. So this is the third aspect. God, from his perspective, is saying, I thought you'd never ask. And that's why the Brahma Sutra, also called the Vedanta Sutra, says, start with asking. Stop beating around the bush and forgetting to ask God, will you marry me? and ask this question to start with. What's my purpose? And when we have this clear understanding, says the Brahma Sutra, that we have a purpose in relationship with, this, with Krishna, and then our lives become purposeful and we can then enact that purpose with the second question, which is, how may it be of service? You want to try asking that question? Don't do it yet. Would you like to try it? Yes. Okay, turn to somebody next to you and say it. Okay. To a person, say it to a person. <laughs> Was it scary? Are you reluctant? Some of you didn't do it, I can see. Don't make me come out there, I'm going to... All right, all right, enough. See, don't you hate that when somebody asks you how may it be of service? You're starting to think of all kinds of ways. It turns out, according to Lord Chaitanya, who simplified all of the teachings of Bhakti Yoga so that anybody, anywhere, could practice them. He's, he gave this simple teaching that our natural alignment in life, where we feel happy and we become insiders in the universe, is when we're engaged in purposeful service. And the most purposeful of all service is service to Krishna. And this was the conclusion of a seminar that took place, it's a little far from here, took place 
in a place called Naimasharanya. You know where that is? It's a forest. It's the, said to be the hub, the center of the universe. And it, there was a seminar. You know how long the seminar was? 1,000 years. That's correct. 1,600 on the SAT. These are all questions on the SAT, Kishori, so you better listen. If you want 1,600, listen to what I'm saying, and you'll know all the answers. So they got together, and they asked the question, how can everybody be happy? How can every living being be happy? And they came as a conclusion to the seminar by asking a very smart person, Sutta Goswami, with the answer, which is, Savai pumsam paro dharmo yato bhakti rathok sije ahaitu ki apratiyata Work with me, people. Last line. Yayatma suprasiddhati means this is how you can be, your heart can be ha come happy. And the answer may be counterintuitive because everyone might think that as soon as I become the master of the world, who thought of that that we know of? Hirani Kashipu? Does anybody know Hirani Kashipu? Yes. How'd it work out for him? <laughs> On a scale of one to ten, be the master of the world. It's something Prahlad, his son, even noticed when he was five. He said, you know, it didn't work out so well, did it, Dad? <laughs> Just got torn to shreds by man, half man, half lion. <laughs> How did it work out for you? Does not very well. That's how it all ends. So they said, try a new way. Savai pum samparo dhamo yato bhakti rahoksaje. means Krishna, the person who never lets you down. And he said, try this. Serve Krishna, be a servant, and ask this question, how may I be of service? So when you ask this question, then you become an insider. What's more, you align yourself with your highest purpose. Our eternal purpose is to render service to Krishna. And when we do that, as Tushta brought up, there's a picture in my book of a tiny screw. What's that doing in there? Tiny screw? It's because Prabhupada gave this example that a tiny screw when it's detached from the machine for which it was made and in which it was engaged and when it falls out and you find it on the Colfax, that's the worst place you could find it. You find it on Colfax and you pick it up and you might think, poor screw. You're no longer engaged. And if you try to sell it at that liquor store in the corner, they won't give you anything. They won't trade you even a bottle of water for that little screw. Right, Blake? No. So we're like a screw. When the screw's engaged in the machine doing its service, it's mighty. It's significant. But when we fall out of service, then we become untradeable. Try it on eBay. You won't get a penny. So, what's, how may I be of service? Try saying that one more time. That's the second question. And the third question is a little scary. Or, I won't say it's scary, but it's hard to do. You want to try it anyway? A scale of ten, 1 to 10, 10 being like the most difficult thing you've ever done. It's about an 8. Are you up for it? Yes. No, I'm not convinced. We should probably skip this one. No, I don't think so. No. How much do you want to try it? Yes. Not very much. At all. Third question is, say it after me, please, if you wish. What's the lesson? The reason it's so hard is because if you stub your toe, you don't say that right away, do you? Admit it. No, you don't say that. And if someone says they're going to give you a ride, then they don't show up. Is that what you say? <laughs> there are so many ways in which we become disappointed in this world. And we may even call them reversals of fortune. We thought we had it and we lost it. Is this sounding familiar? It's the, the song of the material world. Uh, and like if you don't like country, maybe you like blues. Yeah. 
baby took the caddy, left me the mule to ride. There's a, all kinds of people singing blues everywhere about how they had and then they lost. And that's the story, wait, I should use the world's smallest violin, right? <laughs> of the jiva in the mature world. In fact, it's not really a laughing matter, it hurts a lot. How much? The Srimad Bhagavatam says, there's an ocean made of the tears of all living beings who have been in the material world cyclically reprocessed over and over again, experiencing the same kind of disappointments, and they cry so profusely that it's formed an ocean. Therefore, the remedy, or I should, should say, not therefore, there is a remedy to this. The Srimad Bhagavatam says, change your understanding of the world. The world is a classroom. Say that. The world is a classroom. That leads to the question, what's the lesson? Everything that happens to us is purposeful. Say, everything that happens to me, that happens to me is purposeful. Is purposeful and brings a lesson. I was looking to use the word bequeath, but I couldn't fit it in the sentence on the fly. <laughs> There's a lesson that's bequeathed. I wanted to say that because it's, it's not impersonal. I shouldn't use a passive sentence. There's a way in which somebody's giving us the fruit of our inquiry. And this is one of the basic tenets. If you get this part and this one question, then according to Brahma, who is the head of our Sampradaya, you've understood the philosophy. What's more, if you can follow it throughout your life, just hang in there and follow it, then you're going to attain the perfection of this process of bhakti yoga. And he gave it in a prayer, a heartfelt prayer to Krishna. And he said that any person in this world who can learn that from every circumstance that comes to him or her, even the reversals, the lesson that's given, and accept that it's coming from God himself as a directive, can attain the kingdom of God. And that's the main part. If you can develop the attitude that whatever happens to me is being given to me as a gift. Whatever problems are there are gifts. There's a picture in the book. We're trying different ways to illustrate this. I had three excellent artists and over, we looked at so many drafts. I finally just, we just left it as a, a little gift wrapped and said, problems are presents, are gifts. So Brahma said, tate nukam tam susamikshamano bunjana evatma kritam vipakam pridbhagvapur viravidadannamaste jiveta yomukti pade sadaya bhag. It means that if you can ask this question in the face of adversity, what's the lesson? then you're eligible to go back to the spiritual world and no longer, you've graduated. You've graduated. Who wants to graduate? One, two, three. <laughs> okay, good. So that's the question for you. And the reason I said it's hard is because my default impulse is to say, why me? I don't deserve this. That response is due to a lack of context. Just like when I was trying to get my, and I did, by the way, spoiler alert, my, what is that called? The access when you're able to go past the immigration. Global entry. Global entry. We had to go to Niagara Falls because we needed the... Oh, that's Nexus. Well, we needed Nexus and Global Entry. In any case, we went to Niagara Falls and we were almost done with the process. They investigate your whole life and they take pictures of your eyes. Have you ever done this? Have the government take picture of your eyes? <laughs> so anyway, it was a long process, a lot of paperwork. It's so that we don't have to wait in line because we cross, as we cross borders. I don't like that. <laughs> so I got to the last part of the interview and they called me into a little room. And the lady, she wasn't even looking at me, but she goes, have you ever been arrested? 
Uh. Now, this requires a little backstory. I was a good kid. I grew up in a reasonably decent suburb in Lafayette, California. My parents were upstanding citizens and taught me ethics, morals, and values. But I did join the Hare Krishna movement, and we were pioneers in going out. I mean, I wasn't a pioneer, but I followed the pioneers in going out to distribute Krishna consciousness, even in places where it says, if you come in here, we'll arrest you. So, had I been arrested? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> and when she asked me, have you ever been arrested? I said, probably. <laughs> said, you'll have to be more specific. And I did, in that instant, instance, remember a time when I had been arrested at O'Hare Airport because somebody punched me. And then when the devotees asked the police to arrest the person, he countercharged me. And we both got thrown in the same paddy wagon. That's a lot of fun. And the court case uh, was kind of short, wasn't a big deal. But in any case, it, somehow there was a glitch in the paperwork and it didn't get finished. I had forgotten about it. It was in 1974. And so it was no longer in my consciousness. But when she asked me, it came to the surface. And I realized there was some implication for it, even though it wasn't my fault. And so that happens on a universal level. That We're all on a continuum. We don't know what we've been what we've been doing in previous lives, right? You remember? All kinds of stuff. So we don't know exactly why these, why things are happening to us. So <clears throat> the Bhagavad Gita asks us to investigate the way the world is set up as a classroom and to assume categorically that whatever happens is meant to bring us to our highest potential. And if we ask the question, what is the lesson? Then it becomes fruitful. It means anything that happens to us. And finally, the last question, that is, how can we, even in, a, in, in our life situation where we feel overwhelmed by so many options, decisions to make, and adversarial situations, how may we stay focused? To ask this question, and please, if you'd like, repeat after me. Where, Where am, I am I investing my attention, my attention. Right, now. right now? And the gist of it is that the most valuable asset that every one of us has, I'm going to rephrase that, the only asset we have is our attention. We're very powerful. We're more, more powerful than we know because wherever we place our attention, something happens. Hence the phrase, where attention goes, energy flows. And we're creating all the time by wherever we place our attention. And therefore, as Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Jayato Vishayam Pum Sam Sangas Teshu Pajayate, Sangat Sanjayate Kama, Kama Kroto Pajayate. He says, if you look at something in this world with the wrong intention, you contemplate it and think, how am I going to own and control that? He said, then that becomes part of you. It becomes part of you, part of your, your mindset, your body, like your car. First thing I learned about buying a car. So I'd never bought a car before, so I read up on it. And it said, don't fall in love with the car because it won't love you back. <laughs> so <clears throat> there's a way in which we, we are advised, Krishna advises us to be selective where we place our attention. And actually, he says, you can look at anything you want, but just look at it with the right intention to use it in service. And remember that you, whatever you're looking at, whatever you're contemplating, is an investment, and it's your highest investment. We may think our money, our financial situation, is where we get our most, where we get fortified. That's called ROI when we're looking for return on investment. But return on intention, attention is 
R O. Don't be afraid to say it. R O. Yeah, return on attention. So there is a return, and going back to what I started with, if you throw your attention away, you let it go down to the drain of scrolling on a screen without any real purpose, as a, then you've made, you've thrown away your most important asset. So human life is meant for a higher purpose. We can understand it because God wants to reveal it to us. We just haven't asked. And if we simply ask, he'll reveal to us what our purpose is. And then we can refine it by asking, how may I be of service? What's the lesson? And where am I applying? Where am I investing my intention right now? And now I have time for a five second question. Who would like to ask a question within five seconds? Ten seconds. Okay, we'll accept comments. Go ahead. We don't have an extra mic, so I'll repeat what you say. So the last um, point was reminding me of a uh, research that Google did, and um, the human attention span is only seven seconds now. Human attention span is seven seconds. The goldfish has an attention span of eight seconds. The goldfish has an attention span of eight seconds. Thank you. We'll take two more comments, otherwise known as reflections. Anything you heard that stuck in your mind, or if you would like to register a complaint, or if you would like to ask a question. Yes. Please. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's a really good point. What Krishna, just on a generic level, in the, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna gives this metaphor that can be really helpful. And in essence, it's live like a lotus. A lotus flower grows out of the mud. It lives in the water, in the pond, but it's impervious to water. And no, nor is, it, it's impervious to water and it's not muddy. And Krishna says, you can live in the world, but not be, I hate to use be and be smirched, but you know, and not be besmirched by the lower energies of this world or become entangled. If you see all paraphernalia in the world as engageable in service, that's really the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. Use whatever you like. Use as much as you like. It's not about renunciation. In fact, I bring this up in the book. There is a knee-jerk reaction to the world, which is, I quit. You ever done that before? You're playing and you don't like the way somebody's calling the fouls on you or whatever, and you say, forget it, I quit. I'm going home. So that's one of the reactions that becomes uh, a a philosophy of life, which I'm giving up the world because it's unfair or it doesn't work right or desire leads to misery. So I give up. And the other philosophy is <coughs> characterized by the hedonistic treadmill, which means I just keep trying to enjoy the world and get as much as I can. But there's a third path, and that third path is what Krishna recommends. He says, fix your intention on service. So whatever you have, say you have a car, if you think, this car is for service, I'm going to use it in the service of God. Yesterday we went out to distribute Bhagavad Gita, so that's true. I was there, I saw it. And we needed cars to get to the place we were going. So several devotees volunteered their cars because they wanted to drive all of us to go and distribute Bhagavad Gita. That's a kind of service. It's a way to use your car in service. And in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, yet koroshi dashnashi as duhosi dadasi yet yet tapas yasi kontiya tat kurushva marapanam, which basically means anything you're doing now is fine, just change your intention to use it in service, and then you won't experience 
the, the whiplash that you get from using things in this world for your own purposes and trying to hold on to them, which we can't do anyway. So it makes a lot of sense because none of these things are ours. We can't keep them. So if you do engage them in service, especially service to Krishna, who is the root of all other entities, is the source of all energies. And this is the logic behind bhakti yoga, which is, yes, serve, but direct your service towards Krishna because Krishna is the root of all living beings. And like watering the root of a tree, simultaneously waters all the leaves and branches. So similarly, forming your intention, let me be a servant. And that's why that question is there. How may I be of service? If you keep asking it, you keep aligning yourself. And you'll notice it right away. Like if you go to a, a social gathering where you feel awkward, is that possible? Yes. Has anybody been to a social gathering where you feel awkward? Yes. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And you get there, and you don't know who to talk to. You're not sure if you're overdressed, underdressed, or maybe you just notice that you are both, or you're <laughs> either, either both. And then, then uh, you see somebody that obviously is part of the program. Maybe they're setting up. Or you go over and say, how many of service? And they say, why don't you move those chairs? And then suddenly, you're moving chairs. You're an insider. Other people walk in and go, oh, you work here, right? <laughs> Not only that, you also feel purposeful, aligned. Otherwise, like, what am I supposed to do here? Like, don't want to shock anybody, but high school reunion? Ouch. <laughs> Thanksgiving? Going home to see the family? Ouch. <laughs> what are you going to talk about? Movies, this, that? Get some service just in these mundane arenas, you'll find that immediately you're the hero. You're the hero heroine of the situation. It's like, oh, yeah, serving here, helping out. And that's how the universe works also, Krishna says. If you're the servant, if you become aligned, that's your intention for everything. So I want to use this in service. And if you ask this question, it makes it easier to make decisions in life. Anybody here ever had to make a decision? <laughs> Happens all the time. So if you base it on what's best for my service, you'll never make a mistake. Because if you try to serve Krishna by the decision you make, then Krishna will arrange things so that it works out well. Personal experience. I won't go into all the details, but we've used this technique, my wife and I, in our, our time together here on planet Earth. And it's worked out quite well. Okay, so now we are going to have uh, a chance to sing together. And one of the other features of bhakti, even if you don't like asking questions, you hated the lecture and all the ideas, uh, <laughs> there is a simple way to not only be happy, but also to attain perfection in life those two things together. Does that sound okay? Yes. Say yes. yes. Okay, otherwise we won't feed you. Okay, so. <laughs> and that is to keep a song in your heart. But which song? So Lord Chaitanya said, there's a song that's so nice. If you keep this song in your heart, wherever you go, you're, you're gonna feel happy and you're gonna make other people feel happy. Does that sound like a good occupation? Yes. Okay, so the song is, it's got these words, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Krishna Hare, Hare, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Rama Hare, Hare, Hare Hare. So we had just have a few minutes for this, so we're going to try it out as a group. But we're going to sing a cappella. You know what that means? No instruments. No harmonium, no that. But be ready with the, you're the famous Madunga player, right? Yeah. Okay, get the Madunga, but don't start yet. I'll give, I'll cue you. No percussion even, except for hand clapping. Check and see if you got two hands. Check. I invite you to clap. If you don't, just sit there and appreciate it. <laughs> and we'll clap our hands and we'll sing Hare Krishna. And this way you'll know that you don't know how to, you don't have to know how to play a drum or even get one of these things or play a harmonium. 
It's not about that. It's the power of the mantra itself. So we'll experience that now. And I first offer my respects to my spiritual master and the Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And we'll sing their mantras. And then we'll sing Hare Krishna as a call and response. And I'll start it off by clapping hands.